Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the fourth lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of the nervous system. We're going to talk about bacterial disease, and I've organized this lecture the way I generally look at bacterial disease in the central nervous system, sort of by pathogenesis, focusing on how these agents get into the central nervous system. Then within them, we can group the, the various bacterial genera that exploit every way to get in. I think it's a good way to look at bacterial disease of the central nervous system. I hope you agree. But before we start, I want to thank, as I always do, my friends and colleagues who provided me such great images for this lecture. I hope that I've done justice to them, and I hope they will continue to make their images available, not just to me, but to the general public. Okay, so let's talk about infections of the brain first. Number one rule, meningitis of the bacterial kind is much more common than encephalitis, bacterial disease which affects the brain parenchyma, abscesses, distributed inflammation, much less common than meningitis. Remember that the brain is surrounded by a protective vascular mechanism called the blood-brain barrier. Whereas bacteria in septic animals, we're going to look at a number of those, can get into the bloodstream and can get into the vessels within the meninges, it's very difficult for them to breach that barrier. Most of the time they end up lodged in the small capillaries of the meninges. Some may have the ability to breach it through the use of endotoxin like some of the very hot coliforms, like salmonella. There are also a couple of spots in the brain where the blood-brain barrier is not intact, and there are fenestrated capillaries, most usually seen in the choroid plexus and the circumventricular organs. This allows some bacterial agents access to the cerebral spinal fluid, and once they get into that, they can go anywhere they want in the brain. We're even going to talk later on about direct extension, which some bacteria utilize, and then rare ones, which have even more exotic ways to get into the brain. But if we're looking at the sheer number of cases of central nervous system disease caused by bacteria, then we're going to really rack up a number of cases on the side of the ledger which holds the bacterial meningitides. The overwhelming cases of bacterial meningitis are seen in young animals, especially in neonates in our production animals. Gram-negative sepsis is not uncommon. In other lectures we've talked about uh, joint ill. The umbilicus becomes infected the bacteria extend into the ductus venosus and get into the blood vasc vasculature in the area of the liver where they shower the body. You can see them go to the kidney. You can see them go to the liver proper. They go to the joints and the bones. And another place that they will go is to the vessels of the meninges. Neonatal, neonatal sepsis, especially in ruminants, but also in horses and in pigs, is often the result of varying levels of immunosuppression due to insufficient colostrum. And then, of course, the coliforms, the ones that are omnipresent in the environment of the neonate, are going to be the ones that we see most often. E. coli, salmonella, klebsiella. Streptococcus. When we examine the brain of a young calf, for example, with gram-negative sepsis, you often will see a couple of things. Number one, the capillaries which cover the brain are going to be very congested. The brain might have a reddish color to it. If you look closely in a case of uh, 
coliform meningitis, you are going to see accumulation of pus within the sulci of the brain. The meninges, the arachnoid space itself, is wider in the sulci, narrower in, covering the gyri, so we tend to see pus accumulate deep within the convolutions of the brain. As we've mentioned in other lectures, pus is heavy. It tends to uh, be drawn down over time by gravity to accumulate along the base and in the basal cisterns of the brain. And so you always want to flip over the brain because in longer standing infections, that's where more of the pus is going to accumulate. And here's that reddishness to the brain that I mentioned, which is the result of capillary congestion. Normal brain, because there's so much fat in it, is pretty much white. So when you see something like this, you immediately want to think about the possibility of meningitis. Here's another great picture of how the pus in purulent forms of meningitis will accumulate on the bottom of the brain. And look how red the brain is. And if you're looking really close, did you see the little albino ferret peeking out here? No, actually, that's the base of the brain. But I thought that was cute. Someone looks like they had a little trouble getting the brain out. I don't think this one was me. Um, but I often have trouble getting the olfactory lobes uh, out intact, and often I leave them behind. So I can certainly sympathize with this particular person. A couple of other things to consider about meningitis. As we said before, it's much more common in newborn animals than it is in adults. The signs of meningitis are seen earlier and are more pronounced or dramatic than what we see with encephalitis. Generally this is a time we see pyrexia. We see animals don't want to be touched. They're hyperesthetic. They may have neck rigidity and muscular spasms of the spine. When we superimpose, when they overcome the blood-brain barrier and inflammation extends into the brain parenchyma proper, um, you'll see uh, depression, blindness, and paralysis over time, which may proceed to seizures. You will definitely have changes in mentation, which you don't see with meningitis. Here's a five-week-old piglet. Um, who is showing signs of a bacterial meningitis, may even be progressing to, uh, uh, to encephalitis. It's down on its side. It's paddling because of the muscular spasms uh, in the spinal cord. Uh, it looks like there are changes of mentation. This is a classic presentation for a bacterial meningitis um, known as Glasser's disease. Glasser's disease is a well-known uh, condition in pigs in which there are several organisms, including Streptococcus suus, Hibophilus parasuus, and Mycoplasma hyorhinus, all of which can become septicemic in young animals. And you have an outpouring of fibrin in the potential spaces of the body along with suppurative inflammation. Classically, the pleural lining of the thorax and the abdomen are affected by fiber, which also accumulates on the surface of the organ. Um, those are the largest of the potential spaces. But don't forget the joints and meninges are also potential spaces and will be filled with fibrin and additionally purulent material 
as well as bacteria from the septicemia that these agents cause. Just on a fun note, uh, Dr. Glasser, who identified this syndrome in pigs, worked with Haemophilus parasuus, never really identifying strep suis or mycoplasma as other causes, but the three can cause a almost identical syndrome of fibrillin preulin ex exudate in all of the potential spaces. Streptococcus suis, which, which was identified in, in uh, uh, 1897, may cause the most severe lesions. and in my particular experience, is the one that often will breach the blood-brain barrier due to the exotoxins liberated by strep suis. And these exotoxins, the exotoxins of streptococcus act very much like endotoxin. They cause significant vascular damage. They cause a production of tremendous amounts of fibrin. So whenever I see fibrin in in any potential space, and a lot of it, streptococcus is going to be one of my first thoughts in any species. I can't say that enough. If you see a lot of fiber, and I want you to think streptococcus just for a moment because of the vascular damage that it does. Here's a case of streptococcal meningitis in a young piglet. First thing you're going to notice, look at the tremendous congestion. This animal's got meningitis then you can start to see the fibrin and or pus. It's tough to tell which or both are in there, and likely both, or down in the salsa. And I'm going to bet you that uh, if we turn this over, it will be a tremendous amount of exudate underneath. You know, the meninges... Uh, and the vessels, whereas they do tend to uh, uh, protect the underlying brain, uh, there's not a whole lot of resistance to spread in the meninges. And cerebrospinal fluid is an excellent culture medium for a lot of bacteria. So this meningitis starts out focally, but it will spread uh, fairly quickly and fairly diffusely. How about we just quickly switch species for a moment, and I want you to look at this brain. Okay, first thing you're going to notice, we've talked about congenital defects, and look how small the cerebellum is. That's perfectly normal. This is the brain of a macaque. Macaque and macaques and people um, have a somewhat different appearance to the brain if viewed from the top. We are bipeds and non-human primates fit into that biped model and so the cerebellum is fully formed but it's sort of tucked underneath so if you're looking at non-human primate brains don't say oh i've got cerebellar hyperplasia no this is just the way we are constructed um, we evolved from them and so we have a, a certain appearance to our brain looked at from the top and that's not a, really why i wanted you to look at this but here we have a lot of congestion and all of this fibrin or maybe pus or probably both within the meninges. Okay, it's a little more focal. But look at the tremendous amount of fibrin. We said that usually fibrin accumulates within the sulci. Well, this is covering the gyri as well. Whenever I see that amount of fibrin, I'm thinking about strep. Uh, in non-human primates and in people, Strep pneumonia will cause a severe fibrinopurulent meningitis. They get it from us. Most of the diseases, I've always said, of non-human primates are diseases of captivity. You'll see this in, in the wild. But most of us carry strep pneumonia in our upper respiratory systems. And especially when it gets cold in the winter and we're stressed, we tend to shed it. And then if it's introduced into a naive population of non-human primates, it can cause severe disease. And we have the same outpouring of uh, uh, fibrin uh, into potential spaces like we do with uh, strep suis or coliform uh, disease in uh, young production animals. So that's uh, 
that's strep in a monkey. So just remember, strep equals lots of fibrin equals necrotizing vasculitis from those exotoxins that they can secrete. Here's another case, just to remind me, red brain, lots of fibrin, another case of uh, fibrinopurulent meningitis. This one also is streptococcus, but if you see this, you really have to consider all three of those agents. You can't just point at one. Now, here's an interesting fact, and it goes back to a wonderful Wednesday slide conference from probably a decade ago. Streptococcus can also cause, if it breaches the blood-brain barrier uh, because of that vasculitis, it will get into the brain itself. It will cause a tremendous suppurative encephalitis, sometimes in the absence of overlying meningitis. That could be a sectioning thing, but uh, if you see a suppurative encephalitis in pigs, I also think about strep. You may see, and you probably will see, the vessels within the brain parenchyma become necrotic. There will be exudation of edema fluid, protein in the walls. But I've seen streptococcal. I haven't seen it with the other two agents, but I've seen streptococcal encephalitis. Um, just sheets of viable and degenerate neutrophils, devastation of the parenchyma, necrotic vessels in the area without any overlying meningitis. Remember we said if it gets in the cerebrospinal fluid, it can, uh, it can also disseminate widely within the brain. Hey, are we getting tired of, uh, uh, there's just a lot of really great pictures out here. It's a good one from uh, uh, Herman Canton in Argentina. And this one actually is Haemophilus. So they all look alike. We have this really nice sort of ground glass appearance to fibrin in the meninges. Here's a case, another case of homophilosis uh, by Raquel Reg when she was in uh, either Georgia or Brazil. She's now in Texas A&M, still taking fantastic pictures. And we have the congestion, we have the pus. Um, so. I think we've pretty much talked enough about meningitis and bacterial meningitis. Important points to remember, most commonly seen in young animals. Okay, may be restricted to the meninges or may breach and get into the parenchyma itself. But almost every infection of the brain starts in the meninges. From here on out, we're going to talk about the exceptions to that rule. And then always flip the brain over to look for exudate within the basal cisterns of the brain. Okay, just like most cases start in the meninges, most cases, we talked about this before, start as septicemia. And then some particular agents have the ability to leave the vessels and get into the surrounding parenchyma. Here's an absolutely classic disease most commonly seen in feedlot animals. Animals that are sort of, uh, they're young, but they're not neonates. Um, they're collected and exposed to a bunch of bacteria uh, for the first time. This is a condition I learned as TEME. I like that it's been changed a little bit. TEME stood for thrombotic meningoencephalitis uh, or thromboembolic meningoencephalitis. Now it's been reduced to TME and that's fine, uh, thrombotic meningoencephalitis. And it's caused by Histophilus somni. This used to be the predominant uh, syndrome associated with Histophilus somni in feedlots, but times change. And uh, uh, one thing you need to know about uh, Histophilus somni is there are multiple all important syndromes associated, there's probably five different syndromes associated with Histophilosis uh, in cattle and small ruminants. It's a very important disease of feedlot cattle. Um, and whereas it used, this used to be the predominant one, I think now we see more 
uh, the probably the most common is a fibrinopurulent bronchopneumonia. In severe cases, it can resemble shipping fever. Other syndromes that are associated with it are myocarditis, very classically affects the most hard-working part of the heart, the papillary muscle. So great pictures out there, mostly from Donald O'Toole, who has worked with this agent, who has identified the fact that you often have abscessation in the papillary muscles before it spreads to the rest of the myocardium. He's also done some great work in demonstrating um, the nature of the vasculitis that we've known about for many, many years. It's actually an agent that uh, uh, forms a biofilm within vessels. Um, it's classically known for septicemia, so it will cause lesions in a number of places. A couple of other things I want to mention is the polyarthritis, a manifestation of septicemia associated with histophilus somni, and, uh, and finally something that is more associated with its uh, normal presence in the upper respiratory tract, and that is necrotizing laryngitis. Um, which generally cause, comes as a result of coughing due to uh, uh, so many of these animals develop bovine respiratory disease. They cough. They tend to ulcerate the edges of the larynx and some normal bacteria like Staphylococcus suffused bacterium will get in there and cause a nasty necrotizing lesion within the larynx. But let's get back to the classic lesion on the manifestations of the biofilm formation, sepsis, and vasculitis that is caused by uh, histophilus somni, and this is thromboembolic men meningoencephalitis. Sorry, thrombotic. I, I learned it's TME, T-E-M-E, now it's TME, so it's thrombotic. And that name tells you a lot about it. Um, the nice part about histophilus you can often see bacterial colonies um, within the thrombosed vessels in the brain. You will see vascular necrosis. You will see these great areas of hemorrhage scattered throughout uh, the brain itself. You'll see these sort of depressed soft reddish areas which initially start out as thrombos vessels and then become large areas of ischemic necrosis. It tends to be most severe in the cerebrum but is not restricted to the cerebrum and actually you are going to see vascular necrosis and thrombosis in many organs because this is uh, a manifestation of sepsis. One of the cool things about this and uh, is the presence of thrombi in many of the capillaries in affected areas the easy demonstration of the bacilli and the large numbers of viable and degenerate neutrophils within the brain parenchyma so thrombotic meningoencephalitis histophilus somni a great example of an agent that starts out with a meningitis and easily moves into the brain parenchyma. Here's a picture from Dr. Matty Kupel um, of the brain of a pig. And this is one that we would need histology to come to the correct answer. When we look at this, uh, we see tremendous congestion, hemorrhage. There is the hint of fibrin and pus down in the sulci. We don't get to flip the brain. Um, and if you told me, based on you know, not knowing the age of the pig, if you said this looks like strep suis or some other form of glasses to me, I've got to give you full credit for that. Okay, this is an older pig, and this is a case of salmonella cholera suis in a pig. Now, pigs have two different types of salmonella that they have. They have the host adapted and the non-host adapted. We see this in a number of other species as well. There are some that are 
almost exclusively associated with a particular type of animal. Over millions of years, they've become host adapted. And what we see with the host adapted version is instead of the fibrinonecrotic enteritis or enterocolitis, a screaming diarrhea that we can see um, with certain strains of salmonella like salmonella typhimurium in just about any species you're going to get the diarrhea but in the pig salmonella cholera suis or salmonella typhi suis less common um, will cause septicemia and sepsis inflammation in multiple organs we see the same thing with salmonella dublin in cattle now, Salmonella cholera suis is an agent that will cause sepsis, damage to multiple organs. But another characteristic of Salmonella in the central nervous system is the liberation of endotoxin and the severe necrotizing vasculitis that it causes in the brain and the spinal cord. This is great for an organism that really wants to get into the brain parenchyma. So you will see necrotizing vasculitis and separative inflammation within the brain parenchyma in these particular animals. It can look very similar to a severe case of streptococcus suis. So, but just another good example of a bacterium that starts with meningitis almost always ends up within the brain itself. Um, and I should have mentioned from the start, but it can't hurt to mention it now. Remember the meninges, meningeal vessels, penetrate deep into the brain parenchyma. You still have the blood-brain barrier, but you can see these vessels. They're surrounded by a potential space called the virchow robin space. And they go pretty deep into the brain. Virchow Robin space is an extension of the meninges. Anything that happens in the meninges, any fibrin deposition or, or whatever, can be in these vessels. It appears that they're deep into the brain, but actually they are segregated. They are part of the blood brain barrier, even though they may be deep in the cerebral cortex. Okay. This is a great picture from a article that was published a number of years ago by Dr. Patty Pesavento in VetPath. This is a cat, and this is a cat that also had sepsis due to Streptococcus canis. And you're going to say, Streptococcus canis in a cat? Well, it happens, and uh, believe it or not, Strep canis is a very common uh, pathogen, which is seen in uh, about 10 percent of cats with chronic upper respiratory infections especially in shelter situations you think about upper respiratory infections in cats sure you're going to go through feline herpes virus and feline calice virus which between the two of them are about 80 percent and then we get some of the bacterial agents like mycoplasma or chlamydia um, and streptococcus canis um, Strep canis can come in a number of ways. Right now we're talking about the septicemia, and it commonly will also uh, cause polyarthritis or urogenital infections uh, in animals and diffuse sepsis in neonates. There have been a number of outbreaks in which uh, adult animals have been infected by a sinusitis and a meningitis which was very resistant to antibiotics and and this gives us a classic picture not that different than uh, uh, what we've seen with strep suis in pigs and what we've seen in, in strep in non-human primates so i put it at the end i didn't lump it in there because this is one that uh, this particular agent can utilize multiple ways and it can cam come up through direct extension from a rip-roaring chronic sinusitis and cause meningitis as well. So now we're moving into the area of bacterial infection of the brain proper. Um, obviously we know that this can come from the meninges, especially if the agent 
It has a potent vascular toxin, toxin that causes necrosis of vessels, and it just sort of walks out into the parenchyma. Um, let's look at, at some that uh, other ways that they can get in. Local extension, we, we just mentioned up through the nasal cavity. There are a number of other ways that they can get in. They can extend from an inner ear infection around and through the, uh, it could be chronic wearing away of the bone that encases the inner ear, or it could be in through the auditory nerves in the perineural space. We can see extension. You can also get it from conjunctivitis, anything, any uh, way that it can get in the perineural space, whether it's the auditory or the optic or any of the cranial nerves, um, is a good way for a bacterial infection of the uh, uh, to extend into the brain. Here's a classic disease that starts out in the ear and then extends into the brain. Um, if you're driving by a group of young, maybe year old calves out in the field and all of their ears are drooping down, you may look be looking at an outbreak of Mycoplasma bovis. There are a number. Mycoplasma is, is Bovis is an emerging disease which started in Canada. It's pretty much swept down through the U.S. and it causes a number of different uh, syndromes, including a really severe pneumonia, which can be almost identical to shipping fever. Another manifestation of this is a purulent otitis externa. And so you'll see these animals standing in the field with their ears down. If you get close, you can see that they have this tremendous infection. Um, they often get this um, if they are fed, uh, bottle-fed, uh, pooled milk, which are from cold animals because Mycoplasma bovis um, will cause mastitis. Sometimes, and I've never really understood why someone would do this, but the animals with mastitis, they will pill, they will they can't sell it um, on the market, but they will pool it, and if it's not too bad, they're going to feed it as uh, milk or milk replacer to calves, especially veal calves, and the animals end up getting infected by the Mycoplasma bovis, and Mycoplasma is one of those agents that is well adapted to living. Mycoplasmas are the most stripped down bacilli. They've gotten rid of almost all of their uh, their DNA, um, all, and they are obligate parasites. They can't manufacture many amino acids, so they have to get them from cells they parasitize. They uh, cannot manufacture ATP. They've, they've gotten rid of the, the genetic material for most cellular uh, processes. One thing that they have not gotten rid of is the ability, genes that make them uh, adherent to cilia. So you almost always find mycoplasma uh, in areas with cilia, down in the lungs, reproductive tract, and in the ears. So they're drawn to the ears. So these animals, they drink the contaminated milk, they end up with uh, otitis uh, initially, externa, which then becomes media, interna, which eventually can get in uh, to the cranial cavity as a result of extension, generally in, along the perineural uh, connective tissue. So, great one. Any type of ot severe otitis uh, media interna can extend into the brain. Here's a case from uh, Janet Moore from, from uh, California Animal Health and Food Safety um, showing bilateral, especially right here, um, otitis media interna from strep suis. About 35% of strep suis infections uh, have otitis media interna and can extend 
into the brain that way. Oh, this is a great picture. Um, we've talked about sepsis. This is a, and just going through a couple more pictures before we wrap this one up. This is a great picture, and I'm not going to say, obviously, uh, horses don't use their brain that much. That would be just too easy uh, on this one. We're looking at the rhine and cephalon. Uh, you can see that the uh, cerebrum's a little bit narrow here. There's not a lot of structure. So we're looking up front um, and near the olfactory lobes before it starts to get too complex. And this is a great abscess in an adult horse as a result of bastard strangles. Um, Bastard strangles is, uh, represents about 20% of cases of strangles in the horse. Strangles in the horses is the result of an infection uh, by Streptococcus equi variant equi. This is a normal inhabitant of the upper respiratory system of the horse. And 80% of these cases follow a very st stereotypical progress. The animal develops a rhinitis, a sinusitis with extension to the lymph nodes of the head and the face and the throat, especially the retropharyngeal and the submandibular nodes. Usually these get very big, purulent, they will rupture and drain and the animal will heal. Well, obviously with, with uh, medical treatment, antibiotics, etc. Um, about 20% of these cases, the agent gets into the lymphatics or by direct extension can get into any of the, uh, the tissues in and around there, whether it goes into the laryngeal pouch uh, and causes a, a chronic uh, eustachitis, not the, the guttural pouch, a uh, chronic eustachitis. Um, sometimes they will get into the foramen magnum and cause encephalitis, or in this particular case, probably came up through the sinuses, through the cribriform plate, into the anterior parts of the brain, and this is just a huge abscess. This was a very young animal. I think I might consider, you know, between the ages of uh, 4 to 12 months, I might consider rhodococcus, which rarely will cause brain abscesses. But in, an, in the average horse, when I see something like this, I'm thinking of uh, streptococcus equi, but this particular one is local invasions as well. Local invasion is not uncommon in ruminants. We will see uh, uh, we will see abscesses in the brain of deer that butt heads. Sometimes they poke each other uh, uh, through the um, through the skull. That's a pretty obvious one. Or sometimes they'll hit so hard they will fracture and and the, the basis phenoid bones. The brain of most species, when presented with severe trauma, will dissipate that trauma. And the animals that headbutt as a regular basis do that on a regular basis. But there are parts of the brain that uh, do not handle the stress very well. And the, and the pressure when concentrated there will cause a fracture. Uh, we see this in the basis phenoid bone most commonly in most species. Uh, horses are classic, classically known for flipping over backwards, hitting the point of the back of their head, and uh, they will fracture their basis phenoid bone, which is down under the hypothalamus. Uh, same thing will happen with people that fall backwards and hit their head. And these uh, animals that butt heads will do the same thing. Well, fracturing your basis phenoid bone uh, will impair the blood-brain barrier. It's gone at that point. You also have hemorrhage, which is a good culture medium. So, so sometimes as a result of trauma, skull trauma, we will see bacterial infections. Most animals, a lot of animals will die due to uh, hemorrhage. Uh, but if they do not, over time, you can see bacterial infections start in that area. Hey, another fantastic method of local invasion from bacterial infections is seen in ruminants, especially bulls, or could be in pigs, um, 
in which we implant nose rings. Um, we're looking at the hypothalamus. This is the pituitary, and we're looking at a large pituitary abscess um, that is seen in an animal with a nose ring. There is a large venous plexus which starts in the nose and the cavernous sinus and goes all the way up and encircles the pituitary called the reedy mirabile. And so these animals with this chronic infected wound from a nose ring, it gets into that venous sinus and then it drains back up into the, uh, the, the cella tersica or where the pituitary lives. Occasionally, you will see this as well as uh, uh, from animals that butt heads, but uh, it's just a great lesion associated, classically associated with uh, nose rings. You can see it occasionally um, as a result of extension from otitis media and maybe frontal sinusitis, any type of sinusitis. I just like the story with the nose ring. Here's a great picture from Dr. Donald O'Toole of an abscess, a large focal abscess from the brain of an elk. This may have been traumatically inoculated uh, because elk, like the males, will spar with their antlers. Of course, it could also be, and I don't have any information, it could simply be extension of a meningitis. I just like the, uh, the thought that it's due to uh, elk fighting with those sharp antlers. You can see the same thing uh, as a result of dehorning injuries. When we try to uh, disbud young goats, um, it's usually done by thermal injury. I, I've shown a picture of the thermal injury. Um, animals that survive that initial uh, burning of the brain, the whole thing about disbudding is, is sort of uh, savage. But uh, so you People accidentally leave the uh, cautery on too long. They heat up the brain. If that doesn't kill the animal, um, what you've done is you've cooked the meninges. You have disrupted the blood-brain barrier, and those animals may also die of a chronic bacterial meningitis and encephalitis. More local extensions. An uh, uh, older picture from Dr. Jose Ramos Vara of uh, meningitis, bacterial meningitis, um, from Pastorella multacida in a cat. It could certainly have been a case of uh, uh, sepsis um, or uh, bite wounds in cats, uh, bite wounds to the head, or migrating plantons. So there's a number of ways that. Uh, organisms will get locally extended into the brain. Okay, so we want to wind this one up within an hour. So I'm going to talk about one other way that bacteria will get into the brain, and then we're just going to go through some other random slides um, just to cover a couple of other agents. Um, this is a lesion that is not commonly seen grossly. And what I want you to see is the very mild hemorrhage and malacia within the brainstem of a ruminant. Uh, this could be a dairy cow who's been fed silage, poorly cured silage. It could be sheep, probably not goat. But uh, um, once again, we have this hemorrhage and necrosis. If you look at the sort of yellowish discoloration, that's a breakdown of the myelin. And this is a very uncommonly seen gross lesion. Common to see it uh, histologically though. Can't miss it. Um, it's always in the brainstem. And this is Listeria monocytogenes. They exploit getting into the brain a very different way. They go through transaxonal progress in and around the nerves. Generally it comes in through sensory nerve endings in the oral mucosa and then it migrates to the brainstem and the pons where the trigeminal nerves enter and that's how this gets in. Listeria is a great bacterial agent because of the location in the brainstem. There are a couple of other agents that target the brainstem but they're usually viral. Um, 
and then uh, uh, it causes necrosis, it causes suppuration, and if you throw a gram stain on it, you have no trouble finding the agents out in the necrotic parenchyma. The distribution of inflammatory cells um, is very particular. You have these small aggregates of neutrophils, which we call microabscesses. People throw that term around fairly loosely. Anytime you have a couple of neutrophils together, some people say it's a microabscess. Uh, I was trained classically that when you talk about microabscesses, you're pretty much talking about listeria in the brainstem of a ruminant or occasionally a horse. So this is a great picture. I think this particular picture came from pathology and practice in JAVMA. It's not something that you see too often. So hemorrhage and necrosis within the brainstem of a ruminant horse. I'm thinking listeria. Uh, you can see hemorrhage in the brainstem uh, of dogs associated with canine adenovirus, another very rare thing. Most people don't look at the brainstem too much. Hey, can we go through just a couple of other agents just for fun, which cause bacterial meningitis and encephalitis? Here's a great case of, of bacterial meningitis. This uh, uh, particular a slide is from Dr. Maria Quiroga from La Plata, Argentina. A great picture of a men granulomatous meningitis due to Mycobacterium bovis. Not Mycoplasma bovis, but Mycobacterium bovis, the causative agent of bovine tuberculosis. And I show this. This is a rare case. Here's another one. And a couple of these. Here's another one. This one was from Mario Cagnati in Milan. And one thing I want you to notice um, is it's a meningitis in both cases, but look at the sort of yellowish granular nature of this particular agent. And to my eye, um, you often, and I don't know whether it is a tremendous amount of uh, sort of fat within the macrophages, whether it's the mycolic acid wall of the mycobacterium, but mycobacterium often looks sort of yellowish on gross inspection in cattle. Um, this is not a common lesion. Uh, of every animal that uh, reacts positive for mycobacterium, uh, you're lucky if you ever see any lesions. Uh, you may find one, often you'll see nothing, in the reactors when they go to slaughter. Or you may find one lymph node in the entire carcass that has lesions associated with Mycobacterium bovis. Um, these particular lesions, this dissemination suggests that the animal had either a pulmonary or a lymph node focus that ruptured into the bloodstream and showered the body but it's just really uncommon. But I love these two pictures so I did want to show them. Here's another great lesion in a dog, um, which is a vasculitis. You see petechial hemorrhages in these animals, particularly in the brain, in the uh, testis, and you'll see it in other organs as well. If we cut the brain, you would see that these are concentrated at the uh, uh, gray-white matter interface, particularly, um, and remember, we're not just looking at little petechia, you're looking at vasculitis, and so you're going to have hemorrhage, ischemic damage to the parenchyma around it. Um, this is classically associated with Rocky Mountain spotted fever caused by neorickettsia rickettsii in the dog. It's a, a vasculitis because the, uh, uh, the organism goes after endothelial cells and multiple organs, so you'll see this hemorrhage, which gives rise to the name spotted fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. A bacterial agent, uh, which is transmitted by ticks, Dermacenter variabilis, and Andersoni, and dogs um, are probably the reservoir. One thing you might not know about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it is only seen clinically in humans and dogs. So we tend to think of the you know, other animals can get it, but that doesn't happen. Outside of humans, it's basically just dogs, usually young dogs, German Shepherds, or predisposed, but they're predisposed to a bunch of things. There must be some sort of underlying, you know, immunologic defect uh, in German Shepherds. But you're going to see classic vasculitis. You'll see edema of the face. 
and of the ears. Uh, you'll see petechiation on many organs, especially the mucous membranes. Um, and if you're good with the, your uh, uh, looking at the back of the eye, um, something I never could do very well, you'll see hemorrhages and renal infarcts due to vascular necrosis in the retina. The animal survives like any chronic infection you'll look for glomerulonephritis due to the tremendous number of antigen antibody co uh, complexes that will build up in the blood of survivors of this condition. Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Okay, what's the species? Great. It's a non-human primate. You can't really, whoops, you can't really see the cerebellum. So it's a non-human primate, and if you told me this is a uh, streptococcus uh, pneumonia. I'd be perfectly happy with this. This is a immunosuppressed animal. This one happens to be staph. Uh, immunosuppression, especially as a result of simian retrovirus, causes a lot of uh, mundane infections, a lot of staph infections. Um, some of these animals often may have had manipulations. They may have had uh, uh, tracking telemetry uh, telemetry equipment or uh, skull caps, which would provide a nidus for this. But the immunosuppression associated with uh, uh, simian retrovirus leads to a lot of staph and strep infections. While we're on, uh, while we're on primates, this brain looks pretty good, but there's a large focal abscess within the brainstem, and this is a picture of uh, Klebsiella pneumonia infection, sort of the shipping fever of non-human primates, often seen uh, several weeks after they have been severely stressed or shipped, and you will see uh, gelatinous abscesses, uh, often in the uh, in the lungs, but you can see them anywhere. And this is one that's in the meninges, very focal, was somewhat contained. The rest of the brain looks pretty, pretty darn good. Uh, okay, great picture uh, from Kim Newkirk, and this is a large infarct in the brain of the dog. This particular dog had uh, endocarditis, and so remember, you can. It's a great way to get bacteria into the bloodstream, and they're going to go everywhere. Okay, uh, many of them won't take root, but these go everywhere. This is one that ended up in the vessels of the meninges, and for one reason or another, uh, caused thrombosis and a large infarct. Great picture. Oh, this is just a, a strep meningitis in a horse. Probably could take that one out. We've covered that very well. Uh, my good friend, uh, Paco Uzal, who's also the president of the foundation, doing a fantastic job. A lot of the, uh, the meetings we have every year are directly as a result of the hard work that he does. Um, and he's also one of our best lecturers, but he would uh, he'd be very disappointed in me if I did not talk about clostridiosis uh, in ruminants, uh, especially small ruminants, but we can see it in, in uh, cattle as well. And this is a condition which is often seen in sheep, especially the youngest, the fastest growing, and maybe the ones that are stealing the carbohydrates from the other one. It's caused by clostridium perfringens type D. Um, it is a syndrome that affects multiple organs. You get, uh, uh, initially, you are going to get an enteritis, a necrotizing enteritis as a result of local production of the clostridium type D toxin. The epsilon toxin will get into the bloodstream through the ulcers within the wall of the gut. And anywhere it goes, it can cause vasculitis, hemorrhage, and necrosis. One place that it loves to go to is the thalamus. And so this is a classic lesion that you will see, especially in your best, uh, your best lambs. So enterotoxemia and this another picture here. Um, very, an older picture, but you can see the bilaterally symmetrical hemorrhage 
they're seen in the midbrain of these affected. It's a classic spot for this area of necrosis and hemorrhage. So this is uh, overeating disease or enrotoxemia in lambs. It's a rabbit. It's a rabbit and uh, well, the first thing that I would think about here in this rabbit with a head tilt is going to be pastorella. Pastorella multosida causes a tremendous amount of systemic sepsis in rabbits. It certainly could uh, be causing a meningitis. There could be a large abscess. The abscess I showed you earlier taking up half the hemisphere was pastorella in a rabbit. Um, this also could be uh, encephalitozoan cuniculi, a microsporidian, which causes granulomas in the kidneys and in the brain of rabbits. So another bacterial disease, which uh, it's rare in lab rabbits today. When I started out 30 years ago, every rabbit we saw had glial nodules and granulomas and encephalitozoan in the brain. I haven't seen that in probably 20 or 25 years. Um, but if you go to PetSmart or Petco or anyone that just sells pet rabbits, you're still going to see those classic lesions due to encephalitozoan cuniculi in the brain. Uh, after inoculation, you got about three months before those lesions start to show up. If you're seeing it in your laboratory animals or people working with, you need to talk to them about where they're getting, what sources they're getting their uh, rabbits from because you're going to see it in the kidneys as well, resulting in areas of pitting and scarring. As we wind down, another bacterial infection that will cause uh, diseases within the central, central uh, nervous system, but won't cause uh, lesions on inspection of the, uh, the spinal cord is tetanus, the result of uh, infection of a wound and a concomitant ischemic, which ischemic uh, area, which allows the uh, uh, this organism to, because it's an anaerobe, it allows it to grow, it allows it to release toxin, Clostridium tetani. The toxin um, that is released is known as tetanospasm, and it inhibits presynaptic release of glycine from Renshaw cells. Every lower motor neuron uh, has a Renshaw cell which attaches to it and releases glycine, glycine which prevents that lo lower motor neuron from uncontrolled firing. The normal state of lower motor neurons is to fire, 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 fire. Without the Renshaw cells, we would all be uh, in a tetanic spasm all the time. But the problem is this particular toxin Re release from Clostridium tetani inhibits those Renshaw cells, allowing lower motor neurons to fire. Normally, the spasms start in the face and work their way backwards. We can see in this affected horse that its lips are drawn back, its nose is flared, its eyes are wide open. If we could see the ears, they would be pulled back. Um, over time, it will progress to the hind limbs. Eventually, the animal will die as a result of a combination of stress and paralysis of the intercostal muscles. Um, in primates, it looks a little different. In most animal species, uh, you will see very similar signs. Here we have the same signs in the face. The ears are pulled back. The eyes are wide open. The animal has a sort of sardonic smile. And this used to be called, the, in people, they used to talk about the sardonic smile of tetanus. Notice how the tail is up, the hind legs are back. The only difference between people and ruminants, uh, horses or dogs uh, that get tetanus is that because the biceps are stronger than the triceps um, in non-human primates and people, the arms are drawn in into what's called a pugilist's pose. In most other species, uh, the legs will be an extension because the tricep is the stronger muscle. Well, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't leave without uh, uh, giving a couple of avian diseases that might show some gross lesions. Uh, this is a case of, of a, a great picture with hemorrhage um, due to 
E. coli septicemia, one of the most common uh, bacterial diseases, one of the most economically uh, devastating in, in, in uh, poultry production, has always been cholebacillosis or cholesteptosemia, and the brain is no different. Remember, you're going to have vasculitis, fibrin deposition into potential spaces. And even though the brain of a chicken normally does not have sulci for it to accumulate, you can see hemorrhage and you can see sort of plaques of fibrin in animals with, with cholesteptosemia. Uh, a, a related coliform, which will cause this uh, fibrin and, and pus, not pus because it's a bird, but accumulation of degenerating heterophils. I, I, res, I resist using the term pus. Some people uh, who are poultry pathologists don't really care, but uh, the heterophils of uh, birds and to uh, some extent uh, reptiles do not form pus well. They tend to caseate, become granulomas. And the reason they don't is they don't have a lot of myeloperoxidase, which tends to liquefy uh, the material in which the neutrophils of mammals uh, are concentrated. So I don't use the term pus. They form granulomas much more often than they do. But uh, so this would be a fibrinoheterophilic meningitis due to uh, salmonella, salmonella Arizona, which can also cause a, uh, a ophthalmitis. Um, and ultimately the eye will become thick. The animal will look like it's squinting or winking at you. It's known as rye eye in turkeys. Um, so this could be a number of things. This could be E. coli. This could be, uh, this could be salmonella Arizona. Could even be salmonella pylorum or pylorum typhoid, which causes pylorum disease, but uh, uh, just sort of the, the avian equivalent of a lot of diseases that we have seen before. Well, it's been an hour, maybe just a little over. I didn't think it would go that long, but I think we talked about a lot of great mechanisms for bacterial infection in the brain and some of the agents which exploit those mechanisms. That's the way I look at it. Um, sepsis is the number, overwhelming number one way that, that uh, uh, bacteria get into to the central nervous system. And if they have certain toxins, uh, like endotoxin or, or some of the exotoxins in strep, they can make their way into the brain out through the vasculature. Uh, and then we have local extension, and we even have the transaxonal uh, method, which is used by Listeria monocytogenes to get from the mouth um, up into the brain. It's all great. It's all fun. And I've had a blast putting this lecture down on video. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, for our next lecture, we're going to lump together all of the other infectious agents. So we got some protozoal diseases, some fungal diseases, some helminth diseases, and even some caused by arthropods. How do you get bugs in your brain? Well, we're going to find out in the next lecture. And until then, I wish you a wonderful day. Happy New Year. It is January 1st. Ms. Smeegs and I are here in the office so we can get some of these videos out. And uh, I wish you all a fantastic 2020. I look forward to bringing more lectures to you and have a fantastic day.